Hello and welcome to the I Create Daily Podcast. I'm Leora Alderson. And I'm Devani Alderson. We are the mother-daughter co-founders of the I Create Daily brand. We are passionate about encouraging positivity, creativity, and productivity while bringing you information and resources that support your creative aspirations. I Create Daily is for creators in every genre of creating, from musicians to writers, crafters to inventors, bloggers to entrepreneurs. So if you're into creating anything, this podcast has something for you. So tell us, what would support you most in your journey? You can reach us at creator at iCreateDaily.com. Thank Thank you you for for joining joining us us on on this journey. journey. Hello and welcome to another episode of the I Create Daily podcast, a podcast for creators serious about their work. I'm Devani. And I'm Leora. Today's guest has written 28 books and sold over 500,000 books in 84 countries and five languages, but it didn't start that way. In 2007, when her first book didn't sell, she resolved to, to solve that problem by learning marketing and the book publishing industry, and that she did so well, in fact, that today, Joanna Penn is an award-nominated New York Times and USA Today best-selling thriller author who also writes and publishes nonfiction books and courses for authors. In 2011, after three years of research, study, and application, Joanna Penn and her husband downgraded their lifestyle so they could leave their jobs and focus full-time on Joanna's author business. Today, Joanna, along with her husband and business partner, run their own small press publishing company, Curl Up Press. In addition to being a prolific fiction and nonfiction author, Joanna teaches authors how to make a living from your books through her courses and books, along with a ton of free information on her fabulous podcast and website and newsletter email list called What Else But The Creative Pen. With two com, N's. With two N's. Yes. <laughs> Real to welcome none other than the lovely Joanna Penn. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much for having me, ladies. I, I don't know who that is you're talking about. It just doesn't feel like me anymore. I'm <laughs> like, oh, it's, wait, is that me? <laughs> and, and how cool that you get to work with your husband as well. That's awesome. So we can well, well, let's say it's a mixed blessing. I'm sure everyone who's married can say. <laughs> we yeah. are still married, though. So happy times. There, there you go. go. And, you know, and as we'll get into some of that, I'm sure, um, so as so often happens, you each have your own departments, you know, and so that kind of helps, you know, that you're not getting in each other's way, but rather supporting in your own departments in ways. Definitely. So we're just fascinated with origin stories and the fork in the road moments and events in your life that makes the difference. And so can you just start with sharing with the I Create Daily audience the synopsis of your authorpreneur story and we love that word authorpreneur yeah <laughs> uh sure well i um i have a degree in theology which is not massively useful and then another degree in psychology but i then i actually ended up getting a job in consulting and i was implementing financial systems uh, around different places in the world so i found myself you know after university falling into this job as so many people do and you know i tried different things i tried a scuba diving business, I did property investment, I was desperate to find what I wanted to do with my life. And, you know, hitting that early 30s, and you're like, really, is this it, you know? And so I thought, well, I was kind of dead inside creatively. And yet I knew that was something I was missing. So I decided to write a book about career change, um, which is actually one of my books, Career Change. But I, that first, in writing that first book, I learned about the process of writing. And then when I got to the stage, of oh I should get a publisher I started looking at the publishing industry and found out that it would take two years to get a book out into the world and I was like uh no that that sounds way too long I'm not waiting that long (laughs) so I'm like I've finished it's time let's get on with it so being someone who's kind of uh, a self-starter, I guess. I was like, okay, I can do this. Uh, I've, I've been running my own consulting business. I know how, how to make money. I'm sure I can do this. So I self-published that first book back before the Kindle, before the iPhone, you know, before we had social media, like back in the olden days, it feels like forever ago. But what was so interesting about that process is I thought I was going to be a speaker to corporates about 
escape. You know, it was around that time, Tim Ferriss, the four hour work week that was starting to come out, the whole idea of the side hustle. And yet what I discovered is I really loved writing books. I've always been a reader. So I was like, okay, well, I'll just get into publishing then and started writing, started blogging, podcasting back in the day. I've had a podcast for over 10 years now. Yeah. Um, yeah, YouTube 10 years. And I was just like, okay, I'll just do this. So essentially since 2006, 2007, I've just been creating, as you say, create daily. I pretty much create daily and, um, and then also run my business daily. So I do something creative and something businessy uh, most days. Um, so 2011, I left my job. So it took sort of four or five years um, before I could leave my job. Um, and then in 2015, my husband left his job. We were making enough money that that would support both of us. But um, yeah, and since then, and now, you know, this, I have a pretty successful business uh, doing all these different things. So where you see me now is obviously not the person I was at the beginning. So if people listening are like, whoa, what is she talking about? Right. You just have to take it a step at a time and kind of embrace the possibilities. And even though the world has changed, the technology has changed, our politics have changed, um, you know, we're still creating. So that's being consistent. Yes. Yeah, I love that you talk about that consistency and the time it took not to just start and to get started even if you didn't necessarily know all the pieces you were like well I I thought I was going to be this corporate speaker but oh I love writing and that just opened up the world of writing and publishing for you and the consistency can you talk a little bit about the uh, transition from starting the business those, those first five years but then the transition to oh I'm actually leaving my job because this is supporting me what were some of the steps you took during those five years that enabled you to then make it a full-time living that is a really good question and this is what I feel the biggest issue is people are like oh I'm gonna make a living as a writer I'll just quit my job and then I'll make a living as a writer and as I said it took years so what I did so what I say to people is you need to make that first dollar online it doesn't matter what it, maybe you're hiring your services, maybe you've done a one ebook, maybe you're, I don't know, you've released a song or whatever else, you've sold something on Etsy. But once you can make something, even if it's $1 or $10, that helps you sh shift because then it's like, oh, I can make $10, $10. Maybe I can do that every day. What if I can do it every hour? <laughs> um, you know, and then you're like, okay, so that's, you have to figure out how the business is going to work uh, for you. And then you have to create. So you have to remember that you're an artist with kind of one side of your head and you're a business person with the other side of your head. And you have to learn those skills. So to become a better writer, I had to improve my writing skills. So I did courses on the craft of writing. I still do I work with editors with all my books so that's the one side is the crafts person and the other side I, ha I learned the skills of you know building a website and marketing and cash flow which is a big deal um, and learning all the things you need to run a business finding the right cover designers you know stuff like that and then in order to prepare myself so what I was doing for those years is I would get up at 5 a.m and I would write before work because by the time I went to work you know the, the work would kill me and I would come home and I was exhausted so in the evening I would do things like online courses listen to podcasts um, I started the podcast then so I was talking to people but I wasn't creating uh, in that way so I would do my creation first thing my marketing and business last thing then also we downsized as you mentioned so we um, I said to my husband this is what I want to do with my life and wonderfully he was very supportive and uh, so we sold our house and we sold our investment property and in order that we had a buffer so this is another important thing if you you don't want to be if you don't want to be poor or out on the <laughs> sidewalk, you know, you have to have a buffer. So we saved up that money, we put some aside and we downsized our outgoings so that we could, um, you know, manage that on, you know, because you can't go from the top of one career to the top of the next one. You, there's that dip. So you need that time for, for the income to come back up. And it, it did and it has and it's way surpassed where, where I was before. But it takes that time. So the other thing I did, and this is a mindset thing, is I opted out. So I said to myself, I am not going to do the corporate career ladder thing. I'm going to do what I need to do to keep my day job. But all my energy I'm going to spend on my creative business so I would take a lunch hour and I would go and write or I would sit on Twitter and I would find other things and I would leave 
when I was going to leave, you know, sometimes at four o'clock in the afternoon because there was no more work or whatever, or I would work from home. Um, you know, I would do things that if you really wanted to climb the ladder, you would focus a bit more on your job. But I really um, did that for a couple of years. Um, I went also went to four days a week. So I was able to approach my manager and say, look, I'm not ready to go yet. Can I have four days? And that was fine. And a lot of people are scared of that, but it's really a good thing to do. Um, so those are some of the things I did to prepare myself. But I like, you know, I like money. I like having a nice life. Yeah. <laughs> I was not going to just go to zero. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. I think that's really smart and strategic. And we love talking about habits and uh, do you want to do you want to talk about habits or did you want to dive into more of well, no, yeah, story I was, before we move to that topic yeah let, yeah let's move on and let's talk, dive into just a little bit more of her story um because one of the things that that is so poignant i think especially about your story you know besides the obvious the perseverance <laughs> and the resiliency and the longevity is that you applied first you came from a business self-starter yeah. entrepreneurial mindset first that reminds me of you know basically the most successful authors we know from james patterson to vince flynn to you know all the other names i'm not thinking of right now they, they have done they have been become the most successful authors because they approached it like a business first yeah. and you know there are many writers who understandably are just creators and writers and have you know the, the fiction in their mind or the stories in their mind or the concepts in their mind that they if they're like a coach that they want to teach and share with others um, but you know it doesn't sell itself and you know the best book can languish you know forever in dusty archives of Amazon if it if we don't also approach it like a business and so that I mean it just makes so much so much sense that that was at the root and foundation of your success not just the business mindset but the discipline Mm -hmm. of working and working at it like a business rather than waiting for the creative whim to strike you. Is that yeah, true? yeah. And I think, well, one, I, it's so funny you, always, you say discipline. I don't feel I have discipline. I just feel I love what I do. And I never, every day I'm like, I don't have to go back to my day job. Yay. <laughs> so I, I just love what I do. So I, that in, enthusiasm, so I do have that passion, but I don't build a business on passion. You know, I understand the business model around my passion. But what I would say coming back to your, your thought is I always set out to make a good living. So a six figure, multi six figure living. And I never understood why people would settle for not making money with their with their writing. Writing, I mean, and the creative industries right now at this point in history, you can really do well. You can reach the whole world with with your your creativity um, if you learn the skills. Um, so I think m many writers uh, don't necessarily want to do that. And that's no problem at all. So for example, many writers would rather win a literary prize than make a million dollars. And some of them think, oh, you can do both. But most of the time, those two things are quite far apart. Mm -hmm. And I always say, you know, would you rather win the, the, the Pulitzer Prize or would you rather have written Fifty Shades of Grey and make 95 million in a year? <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, obviously we'd, all want both of those things but the path to literary um, acclaim is quite different to the path to making a very good living and you mentioned James Patterson both the most loved and most hated author around right it's such an interesting <laughs> paradigm and you're so right it's like uh, he's it's like being savvy is its own art and it's sometimes a little bit different than the art of the craft. Yes, they are completely different things. And that's why I say you need to have, well, for me, I need to have both things and I enjoy both things. For me, business is creative because, you know, we, we're creating wealth. We're creating jobs. I, at the moment, I work with around 17 different freelancers. Wow. So I'm, and I'm paying my tax, I'm paying more tax than I ever did in my day job, you know, so we, we are, putting into the community we're creating new things in the world you know here are my books I made those yeah. I'm creating new things in the world so you can do both but you have to decide that that's what you want and the most disappointed creatives I see are people who haven't quite figured out what they want so I know self-published authors who are unhappy because they really just want an agent or a publisher to say 
you're good, you can have penguin on the spine. Mm. And that's fine if you want that. Whereas for me, it was always, I want to make a living doing what I love and I want freedom. Like freedom is my number one value. Um, so being an independent creative really works for me, but it doesn't work for everyone. So that's my challenge to everyone is figure out, you know, who you are, what you really want, what's your definition of success and what are you willing to do to get to that? Yeah, that's fantastic. Now you, I think you said um, that, or some, not in this interview, but on another one that you're basically an introvert and that you started getting invited to speak, you know, and that was, you know, you first thought you were going to be speaking and training in corporate, like you said, but, but trainings around something, you know, is a little different than speaking, you know, traveling around the world you know, and getting paid to speak. Um, so how did you, and, and yet you're so clear, you are such a great communicator and not all writers are as good communicating verbally yeah. as they are written, you know, because <laughs> writing, you can go back and edit and all that, you know, but speaking is spontaneous. And so you're really good. Have you, has that been a journey of development for you? Oh yeah. I mean, you can go back and listen to my first podcast in like March, 2009. <laughs> I mean, this is 10 years on. Um, and, and that's a really good lesson for people is no one, no one pops out good at all this stuff. I mean, I spent a number of years with the National Speakers Association. I've invested a lot in my training. So I don't have a degree in speaking or publishing or writing, but I have spent thousands over the years. I go to conferences. I'm always, always learning. I'm going to a, another conference this weekend on AI and creativity. You know, I'm always learning stuff. So yes, you have to you have to learn the skills that are going to help. What I would say is whoever you are as a creative or regardless, actually, whoever you are, you do have to learn to communicate to people. <laughs> so, you know, if you're going to pitch to an agent, you should probably learn how to do this because every successful author will need to speak in public. If you, if you hit the bestseller list, you're going to go on podcasts. You're going to go on the radio. You might go on TV. You, you will have to speak at literary festivals. So um, and many authors are introverts, but to me, that just means well, the, the definition is people who get their energy from being alone. So you just have to figure out um, how that works with your energy. So I just, when I do go to a conference, I just buffer time to recover and try to be very careful with how much time I spend in, in, in public <laughs> before retreating. Um, but yeah, I mean, stuff like this. Um, so in the mornings, I, I, I make sure I only book a certain number of sessions in, in an afternoon or in a week. And then I keep big chunks of time free for my work. <laughs> and this, you know, this interview is hopefully helpful to people, but it's also part of my marketing. So it goes in my marketing energy bucket. It's not necessarily in my create um, bucket. Yeah. Well, that's like, and using like Stephen Pressfield's concept of, you know, you create and craft, um, like carve out the time that you sit there and your muse will become, will become better acquainted with your schedule, you know, and the respective muse will show up, you know, like, so the creative muse knows, you know, or the creative side of you knows to be ready to flow, you know, during that time in the morning. And then the marketing side, you know, same thing. It's like, you've created that, um, space as it were for the best of each to show up and help you you know in your process yet i'm sure you know back to the discipline thing yeah. that you claim you don't have but you have to have to have been so successful is that the discipline of showing up you know yeah. even when you don't feel like it and then you probably discover that even if you start out like you did yesterday writing an article you delayed and procrastinated <laughs> writing an article because it was like hard to get into and, well, like, I had to edit you know? an article and i don't necessarily inherently love editing and yet it's something that needs to be done. If you're going to write something, you need to edit for mass consumption. You need to make sure it's ready for mass consumption. And, and, but then you get into the process. You're like, Oh my gosh, this is actually fun. I'm yeah. enjoying <laughs> rewriting this again. Yeah. So if, you, if we don't resist that and we can get into the process, but um, I, there's so many things. It's like, my mind is just all over the place with all the things that we would love to talk with you about. Um, but uh, to try and keep it contained to what will serve our audience most. I do also want to mention, though, that you come from a writing family. So what I want to touch on is the fascination with the fact that you started nonfiction and how did you bridge to fiction. But then I also know that 
you grew up in a family interested in books and writing and that you actually helped your dad publish his own fiction book years later after you've achieved your success. So tell us a little bit about your fiction uh, writing journey, if you would. Yeah, sure. So, well, with fiction, I mean, like you say, I've, I've always had books in my family, like, and I been, went to the library a lot when I was small. I think growing up as an introvert child, I mean, I was very lucky to always just be ha have books around me, and that's what I enjoyed. So, um, read a lot, and then uh, so with fiction, basically, you know, fast forwarding to when I. Um, uh, I started writing nonfiction and then I started the podcast and it was actually the podcast that got that challenged me so warning ladies I mean this happens your guests challenge you and one of my guests said to me well I think maybe you've got a block around writing fiction because I said because I went to Oxford University and and kind of the only important you know you have to write an important book or a prize-winning book but I really was enjoying Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code you know that type of thriller and I loved thrillers because I was my work was so challenging I just wanted to escape with a thriller. So hey, this guy um, basically said to me, you know, do you think you've got a block around it? And I was like, no, no, of course I don't. I'm, I can write fiction, obviously. <laughs> so I did that year. Yeah, exactly. I was like, no, I'll be fine. Um, so that year, 2009, I did NaNoWriMo. So if people don't know, it's at NaNoWriMo.org and it's National Novel Writing Month. It's every November. And I wrote 20,000 words then that became the beginning of Stone of Fire, which was my first um, novel. And that it took about 14 months. And I did that year, I did a year of the novel at a local library in Queensland. I was in Australia at the time. And yeah, it was, I was like, okay, uh, this is this is the beginning. So since then, I've written like 17 or something novels. But you said, mentioned my dad. So yes, I helped my dad write his book. But more interestingly for you two, I um, co-wrote with my mum. We've written three novels together. <laughs> my mum was like, I think I should write a book. And I was like, yeah, okay, what, what do you want to write? So we write um, under Penny Appleton. So we have a, a a name and she, she uh, sweet romance so um and the first the first book is called um love second time around which is kind of semi-autobiographical about an older woman finding love um later in life and i was like okay this is cool no there's no sex you don't write sex with your mom right <laughs> You don't go there, but it's sweet romance. So yeah, Penny Appleton. Um, but I think, you know, now with fiction for me, so what I tend to do is I write one or two novels a year. And then I also write one or two nonfiction a year. And I've just finished um, Map of Plagues, which is my next dark fantasy novel. That's with my editor. And my next project will be a nonfiction project around audio books for authors. Um, so I, I really like the balance. And and anyone who writes nonfiction, it can, it's creative in a different way. And it fulfills a different part of you. It fulfills the kind of self-help Tony Robbins side of me. And then the fiction kind of fulfills a different side. Um, so I, lo I love having both. How do you, so you mentioned like two, uh, approximately two nonfiction, two fiction. How do you go into a year structuring that? Um, do you go into a year saying the first quarter I'm going to work on this, the next quarter I'm going to work on that? How do you structure your, your planning and around all of that and goal setting around that? I, I'll tell you what, every year I try and do that. <laughs> and every year I fail because what I do is I'm like, oh, I really, I really should write that now. And then I just want, my brain wants to write something else. Uh, even though I would make more money doing X, I don't want to do it. Life's too short, you know. So I, my goal is, as we said, the balance of the day, create something, market something. So I've always got creative blocks of things going on. This morning, I was editing audio files. So I'm also doing audio book narration now. So I was narrating one of my own audio books, Successful Self-Publishing, um, which is a free ebook, but will, you know, you'll be able to buy it in audio as well. Um, so that's creative in a different way. Yeah. So what my aim every year is to m put new things into the world regularly and consistently and just that makes a business luckily because <laughs> i just can't nail it down in advance well, yeah, it's super relatable <laughs> yeah I think that's, that's a lot of what we do as well um and in fact we have published uh four different goals journals 90 day goals journals um and yet uh full disclaimer i don't use them myself so all the time because 
um, I already have that creative structure. Well, it's and kind of in, invented so, from your process anyway. Anyway, Like exactly. you already had your system. Right. And doing your goals. And that was something that many of our audience struggled with is like, you know, getting things done. Like they wanted to do something when they first joined our group. And then, you know, six months later, they still is talking about the same challenges and struggles and didn't get it done. So it was like, okay, we need to find a way to help people who maybe have a hard time with that out the gate, self-starting kind of thing to begin to structure that. So yeah, I, we totally relate. I think that both ways work depending on what works best for you. And if you're already, you've already got your creative patterns. And I think that we were talking about this just the other day as well. One of the things about being an entrepreneur, except for when you have like interviews scheduled or, you know, hard stop appointments, um, you know, if you're in the flow of writing, you don't have to clock out in no. that moment. And it's hard to clock out when you're in the flow of, you know, creating and writing something. You just want to keep on going. It's not, you know, the idea of clock in, clock out is really not the creator. And that's maybe where many creators get kind of a bad rap rather relative to not being conscious of time. Yeah. You know, because we, we do need to be conscious and work within the constraints of time, but we do have them the freedom, uh, like working as you're working, I think would imagine is the same. And that is just to, um, if you didn't want to because you really wanted to work on something else, then that makes sense to work on that other thing. Mm, I think maybe I've got a combination because I do clock in and clock out. Um, I structure my life by my um, Google calendar <laughs> and every, my life is time blocked to the ninth degree. Even like go to the letterbox and post my Father's Day card to my dad is in my, was in my phone. <laughs> You're so smart. You are just It's just, I love being able to see where my time is. And so, for, for example, my write, when I'm in first draft writing mode, which um, for fiction particularly, I go for, to a cafe at 7 a.m. I'm, I'm at my, there, the desk there about 10 past seven in the morning. And then I go to a yoga class at, at quarter past nine. So I clock in and clock out based on when it opens and when my yoga class is. And I actually like that. I like having time slots in order to know. And then also I know, I'm, you know, I run, I publish myself. I have to make my own schedule um, so that I get things organized. So I know how long, how many of those slots it takes me to write a book. What I don't know is which book I'm writing until I actually start. So it's a bit of a mix. I have all my time blocks in way in advance. Like I'm already booked for 18 months time for, I do some speaking. I'm speaking in America a couple of times. And uh, so that's all in my calendar and I have blocks of time out and everything. And I, I organize a whole year, but I just don't know what will go in that block. <laughs> Oh, that's that so makes smart. Sense. Yeah, and and it offers both. It's it's like it offers the this the structure you need as a creative, but then also the create the creative within the space. Structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Con uh, creative constraints as yeah. we, as we've often mm -hmm. talked about. It makes perfect sense. And and yeah, I think in a way we do. So we don't have um, those hard those that are scheduled as structured as you. But what we do use is the toggle time app. So we're tracking constantly what we're doing. So we have a sense by the end of the day uh, where our time is. But I really, what I really like, and we should actually try that too, about what your, your process. I think one of the advantages also is it really helps not burn out. You know, it yeah. helps you keep, make sure that your life is balanced. Um, because I know that right now ours isn't because we don't have the time for the yoga class, you know, kind of thing. So it's sort of yeah. like, and when you do know that you have like an hour and a half to write, then it really helps you hone in on that focus. So that makes so much sense. Oh yeah, and now I schedule my Sunday walks. <laughs> You know, I have my sort of five hour, six hour, I do a bigger walk on a Sunday. And I would say one of my books is uh, called The Healthy Writer that I co-wrote with a medical doctor. And part of the reason we wrote that is because we were all, the, the author community was really suffering. And still, you know, it, people suffer, there's RSI, but then there's mental health issues. And, and I was having pain and headaches and, you know, back, pa back pain in the writing community is like yeah. endemic. <laughs> So you have, and I found yoga, what, three years ago, and I, I just now, I, ha, I know I have to do my, if I don't do yoga, my whole career goes down the drain because I'm in pain and everything fails. So whatever works for you, but understand that the only way to be productive is to be physically healthy. Yes. I'm so glad you mentioned that because the physical health also helps the mental health and mental yes. care. And, and if you're a writer, you're in your head so much. Like, and, and you're working that muscle, but you also need to work the other muscles so that that muscle works well Yeah. For your brain. Your brain isn't really a muscle, but you know what I mean? Like yeah. yes. the mental muscle. Yeah, definitely. Mm, definitely.
So one of your goals that this lifestyle affords for you is the love of travel. And I've enjoyed the stories where you talk about, you know, traveling to different places. And, and it's so easy for any fiction writer to imagine um, the stories that would be flowing to you and coming to your mind from all the different places and, and that you see um, and unique experiences that you have. Um, and also you enjoy the research part. So that's like your two fiction yeah. books a year, you get to travel and then that travel is about the research. So would you like to elaborate on any of that? Yeah, sure. So um, when I like coming back to what do you want with your life? Um, like back back in the day, 2006, I, I wrote down, you know, I want to read, I want to write and I want to travel. I, those are the, that's what I want to spend my life doing. <laughs> and that is pretty much And I didn't realize I wanted to podcast, but you know, that came later. <laughs> but um, so travel from I've always traveled, you know, my mum first took us to Africa, I went to school in Africa, Malawi, uh, when I was eight. And then we you know, traveled a lot, um, or always. Um, so yeah, I guess for me, I get inspired by place. Um, so in, in the U S I've written, um, Valley of dry bones has new Orleans and San Francisco, which were trips I did a couple of years ago. So everywhere I go, I'm picking up ideas. So we were in Amsterdam a couple of months ago and I went there. I said to my husband, let's, we need a break. Let's go to Amsterdam. I know I will find a story, but I didn't know what I would find. I just knew that if we went to places in the city that somewhere something would catch my eye and I'd be like, Oh, okay. And, um, I did, I found it in the, the old, um, Portuguese synagogue in Amsterdam, which is, I was like, what is a Portuguese synagogue doing in the Netherlands? This is weird. <laughs> And then I started to go down this rabbit hole of, of, of the Portuguese empire and the Jews in the Portuguese empire. And I was like, okay, yeah, there's a story here. So that's just one idea. Um, or the current series map of plagues. Uh, I live in Bath in the UK. And when I first moved here, I saw this map shop and I was like, how cool would it be to have a map shop? And it was run by this really old dude. So I thought, well, what, what happened? To, what happens if he dies and leaves this map shop to his granddaughter? And then what if adventures ensue so <laughs> oh, oh that's amazing yeah yeah so i love i mean i really enjoy the series the first book's called map of shadows if you're interested but mm -hmm. it's you know everywhere i go i just see stories and then um you know i have put my pictures on instagram and pinterest and then i also have a new podcast uh, uh called books and travel and mm -hmm. I'm talking to authors about the places that inspire them and also doing my own kind of travel memoir episodes, uh, weaving in my books. So just to encourage people, uh, when you're thinking about being an entrepreneur or what you want to do with your life, um, finding ways to integrate what you love with your work, it doesn't mean you don't have work like life balance. I mean, you could say everything I do is work, but in a, in a wonderful way. <laughs> Right. And maybe, maybe that is the balance. The fact that you can weave every element into what you do in your creative career. It's like creativity doesn't shut off. You know, it's just not, it's not a switch that you're like, oh, I'm not creative anymore. Or today I just, I can't create at vacation. all because I'm on vacation. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't, it's, it's like this thing that's outside of our control almost <laughs> and so having that lifestyle and flexibility and if like if that's your goal like tune in to people like you who have built the lifestyle around mm -hmm. your career and like your career and your life are almost one in the same and yet yeah. you're getting all the enriching value the breaks the you know whatever you need that sustains you too so beautifully interwoven yeah yeah yeah, it is. And yeah, and also uh, just on the business side, if you create a book from your travels, your travels are tax deductible. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Um, and it varies probably in percentage by UK and US, but check with your CPA, it is absolutely, we do that as well. Yeah. Um, we have um, gardens and we have a gardening website. And so everything that we buy for the garden is a business um, deductible. Same thing with, uh, we get photos for our travels. We interview people where we go. And so it's all tax deductible. And in fact, just the other day we were talking about, we got our dogs groomed and we have dog websites uh, about the breeds and stuff. And so, it was, and, and it was just like, oh my gosh, duh, they're models. <laughs> <laughs> They're employees, right? Right? Yeah. We can do this. Right? And obviously, like, you go check with your attorneys and stuff and figure CPA. out how you do CPA, yeah. sorry, and figure out how that works. Yeah. But, um, but it yeah. Just, and it makes so much sense. It's so integrated. And 
uh, where it really, like you were saying, even though you're making more money on your own than you ever did before, um, you are, you're still paying taxes, you're paying more taxes, and you're creating so many jobs. So it's really yeah. a win, win, win scenario. Let's dive into some of that too in the next half. Like just what, so we've talked about you have built this awesome lifestyle that supports all the aspects of your life that you want. Uh, so how on the nitty gritty side, marketing wise, what are you doing with your book? Because again, we have lots of authors who are not at this place where they can just take off and do, and have this type of lifestyle. So what did you do? What do you do marketing wise to get your books out there, get them sold? Like what is that process and what are some of the top things? Yes. Well, so first of all, let's just come back to the author entrepreneur thing. So my income is not just from book sales, really importantly. So I think that in this world, just relying on one product stream uh, can be difficult. Um, because things change. Uh, so, you you know, what worked one year might not work another year. So um, books are, you know, a big chunk of my income, book sales. Um, and we'll just, we'll come back to marketing in a minute. But I also make affiliate income, as you guys probably do from your website. So I um, have links to, um, you know, like I have a YouTube video on how to work with an editor. Oh, and by the way, here's a link where you can find some editors. And some of them, it says, you know, if you click this link, I will receive a percentage. And it's all very very visible it's all very ethical but that is um, a traffic based revenue based on my writing and my videos and my content but that is really good um, because my website's been around for 10 years so I'm you guys understand that business model um, and that's a great recurring revenue stream uh, also my podcast now I make um, almost as much as my book sales now from my podcast because I have corporate sponsors I have patreon um, and I also sell my own products. Uh, I also have courses. So courses on how to write a novel, how to write nonfiction, that type of thing. So I have all of those different things. I don't, I do a bit of speaking, but it's like half a percent of my revenue. So it's mainly for travel. <laughs> if anywhere, right. if anywhere pitches me from a place I want to actually go to, then I'll speak. <laughs> yeah. That's my yeah, but coming back to book marketing, so um, this will depend on how much control you have over your product. So I'm, I have my own publishing company. I'm self-published or I'm independently published. So I have control over my pricing. So having, obviously, you can price cheaper and make more revenue. You can make 70% royalty if you publish yourself. Um, so that's a big deal. Also, you have control over things like Amazon advertising. Uh, things like Facebook advertising. So paid ads are a big thing in the author movement right now, which many traditionally published authors can't do because they don't have control of their books and the amount of money they make on their books doesn't make it worthwhile for them to pay for advertising, let alone them wanting to learn. So authors who are not using paid ads at the moment on something like Amazon are definitely finding a struggle. So paid ads would be one side, but then on the other side, for me, it's content marketing and it's always been content marketing. So I've been blogging for 10 years, podcasting for 10 years, um, a YouTube channel, and that has mainly been for nonfiction. But with my fiction, that's why I've started Books and Travel, because I believe content marketing is the best form of marketing for the long term. So, and I've started narrating my audio books because I want to build my voice brand in, you know, in audio books as well as podcasting. So I think those two things go together. Paid advertising is like spike, book sale, disappear, have to pay again, pay again, pay again. Whereas content marketing is something that is really, really slow start, but years down the track, it just builds and builds and builds. So that's my next sort of 10 year plan is building another site. And you guys obviously have tons of websites, so good on you. <laughs> right. And it is, but, but not tons of books. So, you yeah, know, there you go. A, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Tons of, or tons of YouTubes. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. So no, it's fantastic. And I think that this is so helpful for authors to recognize yeah. that, you know, it's, it is so much more than just a book. And in fact, so, you know, like we could look at your journey and say, yes, but you've been doing it for, you know, over 10 years. And so how could anyone start now and, you know, ever hope to achieve that? How could they catch up? But like you were saying, the, the market, the industry keeps changing yeah. as do the opportunities. So as one avenue gets traffic, traffic, saturated with traffic and hard to make headway, 
new ones open up yeah. and new opportunities. You mentioned uh, reading your own audiobooks um, and as well as perhaps others. Um, so what we've been wondering is like we do one of the things that we do on our website on our ourcreatedaily.com side is we started reading our articles so now uh, we have alternate podcasts that publish as audio articles um, of our so and you know that seems to be helpful some of those rank ahead of time ahead of the actual written article but what we wondered is with voice uh, computerized voice technology improving you know you've got Alexa mm -hmm. and you've got Siri and you know those sound good they don't sound like the computer the read to me computer voice and they're getting um, better text, over the years, yeah. uh, what is it text-to-speech yeah they sound better than that do you know have you heard anything in the industry um, on how you know the projections of if that's going to overtake the authors reading their own or paid out voice actors reading books yeah, I mean, this is something I am deep into right now. And I've got, um, I'm actually uh, going to an AI conference this weekend. And I've got a, a big podcast coming on my show in a, about three weeks, probably when I'm going to go into all of this in more detail, because I feel like I feel like audio in 2019 is like ebooks in 2009 as in we are at the very beginning of what is going to be massive and probably more disruptive than ebooks um because of the way that people are interacting with devices i um i in fact i i even have my uh, my echo here i've been playing with it and testing it and working out how i'm going to do things so on voice um voice tech i what i see is that we will be going into a, a kind of buy uh, you know, a split world where you might pay um, $2 for an AI read audiobook, or you might decide you want to pay a premium to hear the author read it or a famous actor read it. So that would be a bit like a paperback versus a hardback. Yeah. I don't think, you know, some people will prefer one thing or there's a book I just want to listen to, but I don't care. I just want to hear it. I don't care whose voice. So it can just be Amazon Polly or whatever. Um, the other thing, so that's one thing. I think that's going to happen in the next two years. I mean, by 2021, we'll be there. Um, but um, also, I don't know if you've seen, it's only in the last few days, but the Mark Zuckerberg deep fake video. I, I saw the headline on Alexa, yeah. but I didn't look at it. Did you? I, yeah. no. I know it exists, but go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, okay. So it's well worth looking at this video because what it is, it's um, a, a group who have decided to show the world how easy the, well, not how easy, but how these deep fakes can be done. And it's Mark Zuckerberg, like, just like you see me now. And he's basically saying, what would happen if one man controlled the data of billions of people? And, you know, I have Spectre to thank for that. And basically it's his voice. It's his, it's him, but it's not him. It's a fake, but it's so incredible incredible so they've um there are companies there's, there's a company called liarbird.ai um that are doing voice synth so this is the other step um so voice synth would mean for example you decide you like my voice and you want to license my voice for your book but i don't have to read it i just license my voice to your ai and you would pay me a fraction of what you would pay me to read it live, but it would still be my voice. So I see that coming as well, um, which is partly why I want to establish more of a voice brand because I want you to want my voice. <laughs> yes. Wow. Yeah, so I see those things coming. I also, um, why I'm pretty obsessed with this um, is because probably like you guys, I make a lot of my money from traffic to my website. And they're saying that 50% of web search will be voice enabled from 2020, which is next year. <laughs> Oh my gosh, right? Well, oh. yeah. So I'm like, okay, well then what does that mean? And for example, it means you want your books in audio because if you say to um, Alexa, hey Alexa, um, you know, it's read me a book. It's I want, or I want to listen to a podcast. It's all audio and voice. So if your book isn't in audio, um, then you'll struggle. And also it depends. So if you say to Alexa, play me an audio book, it will be audible. So that's Amazon. If you say, hey, Siri, read, you know, where, what's an audio book by Joanna Penn? It's going to Apple books. Mm -hmm. And if you ask the Google Assistant, it goes to Google books. So if you are only on the Amazon ecosystem, you're going to miss out on 
Siri enabled and Google Assistant. So for me, this is a sort of, you need to get out of the Amazon ecosystem beyond Alexa, but also beyond the other devices because Google, <laughs> Google actually has the biggest penetration because it has developing markets through the Android devices. Something like a billion devices have the Google Assistant now. So this is definitely, it's a great question and something I am obsessed with right now. So I feel like this is the next 10 years for me, I'm really looking at, look, what the business I set up in 2006, that's not the business I have now. And what I will have in 2029 is not what I have now, but I need to position myself so that my, I don't get another dip. I don't want another dip. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. totally. Yeah, just keep on on going. So, I mean, if if people are kind of, whoa, what's going on with this stuff? I mean, every episode of my show on the Creative Pen podcast, I have a futurist segment. So not not every show, but almost every show. And then occasionally I'll do shows on these topics um, because I am pretty obsessed with AI and voice tech and the way technology is going to change us for the next thing. Um, Another podcast I really recommend to people, it's called Sleepwalkers Podcast. And that is like, it will blow your mind what is actually already here. Um, And when you think about, and I'm very positive about it, I don't see this as a negative. I see this as the same way we are talking over the internet for free. That's the type of thing that's going to transform our future. So we've got to surf the wave and enjoy surfing the wave of change instead of waiting for it to destroy us. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, and if anybody has followed your career, this is probably one of the reasons you're so successful at what you do is because you aren't afraid of the leading edge of your industry of being an author and expanding it and constantly. I remember when eBooks came out and you were one of the uh, authors that was constantly talking about innovative ways for authors to use ebooks. You were this passionate when ebooks came out about mm-hmm. the ebook way to sell things. Like mm-hmm. I was seeing you everywhere when it came to <laughs> authors talking about ebooks. And I think that that's really an important takeaway for creatives is like, okay, yeah, you're an artist and that's amazing. But what about your art in the context of how the world works today? And that is just so important, carving out that time to be obsessed with how your work is going to be engaged with. Mm, And also new ways of creating. I see building an Alexa skill similar to publishing an ebook now. I see it as, okay, so what can I do a choose your own adventure novel for Alexa first? Why does it have to be produced as a book first? Why shouldn't it be um, a, a skill? So those are the types of things I'm considering for the next sort of, you know, the coming year or two for me. And again, if people listening haven't even started their first book yet, then sure, this might be getting a little far ahead of you. But, but be excited about the possibilities. That's kind of what we're saying. Always be looking for the glass half full, because that's the, the happy way to be a creative. <laughs> Absolutely. And yes, and we're very big on that, on mindset, on uh, seeing opportunity as adventure and something, you know, the wonder of learning. Um, And, you know, where it is that we get bogged down is where and when what it is we want to do or think we want to do doesn't seem like it can happen uh, right away or as efficiently or as soon as we want it to. But we just accept that that may not be the case if it isn't the case. And then ask the next next question like you did in 2007 when your first book wasn't selling. Okay, well, there's got to be a way, you know, and then find a way to solve that. So along those lines, when you, well, I know that you've been on such a learning journey that some of the things that you originally studied may or may not be what you would recommend now. And of course, uh, you probably have some of the best courses and books for authors because that is your niche uh, and that would serve creators as well. And so we'll be sure to link to those. But besides your own or in in addition to your own, what courses would you, could you recommend or course for new authors now on how best to, um, you know, like basically to begin to take this journey one step at a time? Because that's the thing. There's so many things out there and so many options out there. And again, we recommend, and we did on the coffee break prior to this session, that if anyone was to learn anything about how to sell your book, how to make money from your book, that they should tune into your podcast, your website, and your courses. Um, So in addition to that, what else would you recommend? Oh, look, 
To be fair, this is a really hard question. Um, so instead, I will say to people that you, instead of, there is so much information on the internet. I mean, I went on your website and you like my website, it's full of stuff. Like you can learn loads of stuff just on my website or your website, uh, let alone the rest of the internet. <laughs> so this is why you have to take a step back and stop and go, you have to kind of take an inventory of your own situation. So first of all, like I said, what do you want? <laughs> so for example, if you want to write a novel, and make a full-time living with fiction, that's completely different to someone who already has a business and wants to write a book in order to get speaking gigs. Right. So I can't, there's the same, there are no, that you have to do different things. So first of all, what do you want? And then secondly, what level are you on those two axes? So what level are you creatively? For example, um, you know, I'm, I was very educated in lots of things, but I'd never written a novel. So I went and did a course on doing, on writing craft. But um, I had some knowledge of say accounting and cash flow, So I didn't really need that. But if you're listening and you're like, okay, well actually may, I've written, like I know a lot of authors who've written 10 traditionally published novels and they have no clue about business. So really they should actually learn about cash flow or building a website or book marketing so those are the types of things I would say to you so first of all what do you want and then where are you on the, the craft side and the entrepreneur side and then go look for a voice that you resonate with so a model someone whose career looks like the career that you want and then listen to that person. And this is really important because there's a lot of, again, there's a lot of voices in the community. So you have to decide who to listen to and who resonates with you the most. And that's why I love podcasting. I mean, whether or not people, um, if people are still listening, then presumably they resonate with us. <laughs> you know, but maybe the people who've turned off they will find a voice somewhere else. Or maybe you're listening to me and going, I don't want a career like hers. I actually want to keep my day job and write one book every 10 years and win a literary prize. In which case, go find someone who's done that and follow what they do. Masterclass.com, I'll recommend them because I, and I'm doing a lot of their courses because you get people like James Patterson or, um, Dan Brown and you know a lot of big traditionally published authors uh playwrights and screenwriters and you know you can learn a lot craft wise there um so yeah those would be more my points you know really take an inventory of who you are where you are and then where you want to go so like uh, and also you have to keep doing this so like we're just talking about with voice tech up until last week I didn't know how to build an Alexa skill, <laughs> but in the last week, I've actually built a little one for my Echo. And, and you did it yourself? You yeah, it I, did it, I did it myself. It's not public. Um, okay. That's a different process, but I, that I've started to learn something new because I took an inventory of myself and went, uh, I don't know anything about this. <laughs> it's strange. Yeah. Well, you know, they're calling it now when you um, ask for Alexa to play your skills, um, she calls it news. She says, so now they're changing the name, it seems like, to uh -huh. from flash briefing to, at least on the flash briefing side, they're changing it to news as if they're wanting to make it like more official perhaps than flash briefing. Or less different and or it, less like, let's not use our own lingo. That was a bad idea because nobody was adopting it. <laughs> yeah, but... But, yeah. Well, but that's a good example because that's why it's 2009 for eBooks because... No one even has the language yes, for this right. stuff. And we're making it up as we go along, you know, and the stuff um, I remember talking about this in the, you know, I got back to England I moved back to England in 2011 and people in London, I went to publishing conferences. They're looking at me like, who are you? Why are you talking about eBooks and all of this? And like no clue whatsoever. And then suddenly 2014, I think it was everywhere. And then podcasting, you know, again, I've been doing it 10 years. No one was talking about it until 2014, 2015. And it went boom. And, you know, now it's, it's huge. So this is the thing, like you're saying with, um, with the voice assistants, these are early days, but you know, you look at little kids with them and not, it's like little kids totally do it naturally and then boomers who are struggling to read on small devices um also loving it so it's definitely happening it's just a case of getting involved and, and learning things absolutely sure. before we let you go um and 
on the on the back of hearing what you had just the, the fantastic advice about you have to assess your goals um, and decide where you want to go of all the things that you are doing though for revenue for earning a living from your craft um, you know from the affiliate to advertising to courses um, coaching uh, and of course book sales um, what is it that you would you where what is it that provides the most revenue for you of all the things that you're doing if you if you don't mind sharing that no, sure. I, I do an annual um, revenue thing on my website and uh, I have a book on how to make a living with your writing. I talk about it there. Um, but um, so at the moment it is about 50% of my revenue is affiliate income. And that's why my book is called How to Make a Living with Your Writing, not with your books. Because, yeah. you know, you guys know, I mean, my, my website with 10 years of posting three or four times a week has millions of published words on my website which drives revenue without the words there would be no revenue so I even though they're not books they are words um so yeah 50% there probably and then tw uh my book sales are about 40% and then courses yeah whatever that is 10% left uh very little for, for sp oh podcast oh, okay so probably maybe 40% then affiliate, um, 30, 30 on, on Patreon and my books. Okay. Yeah. What, whatever. I don't, I can't remember, you know, something like that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we will link to that page on your site. So that will help as well as to that book. Oh, actually, well, the, the page to link to, um, is the creative forward slash timeline. Because on that page, I've actually, from the very beginning, I have kept the, the main, posts that I've written over the years like year one as an entrepreneur and you know I got an agent a New York agent and then when I decided that wasn't the right route and you know all of that so that would be the place to go to kind of see the development and that has all my um, revenue posts on too okay perfect oh one question I did have just in terms of obviously you wouldn't need to you have an established career as a writer and author and published and you have your own publishing um independent publishing do you ever have a goal of having like at least one book published by a traditional publisher or just nah like you don't need it like why would you need to when well it's you know, it's funny you ask that i mean i would i amusingly i do actually have a goal to win a literary prize at some point i mean in my life i'd like i have i'm award nominated i didn't win i was in the room and i i you know uh there were five of us and i didn't win so I was upset and I would like to win a prize at someone I'd like to be recognized for the quality of my writing hitting bestseller list is all very well but it's just a game really yeah. um so I would like to do that um and getting a traditional publisher makes that more likely because most prizes are not open to independent authors mm -hmm. so you literally can't even enter <laughs> so um yeah but then every time I think about it I see some of the negative sides so there are a lot of pros and cons of going indie or traditional they both have really positives and really negatives and whenever I look at it I go oh I just I just, I I just put it out there yeah. Yeah. I don't want to play that game well and you know that may be one of the things changing it may be yeah. that those prizes will follow suit with the rest of the market and also be awarded to indies over time I, I, I hope so. Um, well, I say I hope so. I very much appreciate traditional publishing industry. I read a lot of traditionally published books as well as indie books. I have no, I'm not someone who says, oh, we should all go indie. No, not at all. Um, it definitely only suits some people. Um, and I have a lot of traditionally published friends who are very happy and many who are not happy. So again, it's all about the the pros and cons so I, I definitely am not writing it off and obviously I have publishing de deals in other countries mm -hmm. um, licensing deals in you know I, I did one recently in South Korea I'm not going to self publish in South Korea um, I'm pitch, pitching into China um, you know places where I would never do it myself I you know I, I would love 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 to get a traditional deal in India because it's a country I very much love and it's very print heavy right now so yeah, I think you can, you can, I, I have a lot of goals for the next 10 years um, and I'm very excited about it. The wonderful thing about an industry, if you enjoy everything, every part of this is that um, your goals never stop. The goalposts stop, don't stop moving. 
horizon, the horizon is ever moving. <laughs> Which is wonderful. But what, you know, one of the thing that, you know, I do keep going every day because I love it, but also because this is our income, me and my husband, this is what we live on. So um, it, it's both, it, both purposes, really. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you said that because I did want to ask about the foreign. So um, what, how did you, how do you, what do you recommend for someone who wants to get into publishing in foreign languages and markets? Uh, well, you really need to license. I mean, some, I tried self-publishing in German and Italian and Spanish uh, about five years ago. And there's no problem with hiring a translator. Anyone can hire a translator. AI translation is coming in. So um, uh, I interviewed a guy the other day. Uh, he's a language teacher. He said his job will probably be gone in five years because of what the AI translation market. But that does not help you market. And as we talked about, like you can have all the books you want in Spanish, but if you're not marketing them to a Spanish audience, you will, won't sell any. And that's the problem I found. So I had books in German and Italian and French and, and Spanish, and they weren't selling because I couldn't market in another language. So my opinion now is that you should license your rights to publishers in those other markets. And that itself is an entirely different thing um, and something that, again, I, I want to focus on. So China, for example, I have a company that I'm getting ready to approach with, um, you know, these are the books I have, are you interested? Um, so it's like pitching, but you're pitching an already existing product. So like the one in South Korea, um, my book, The Successful Author Mindset is now in Korean. Um, and they have the license for that in print in South Korea. So, and I, yeah, again, I wasn't going to do that myself. So that would be my uh, opinion. And that is, of course, what an agent will do for you if you get a traditional publishing deal. So swings and roundabouts. Right. So did you go through an agent for that? No, no. Um, actually, the South Korean, uh, they an, are an agency. They approach me. This is the other thing. Sometimes uh, I've had most of things come to me because I'm out there. So if you have your books on Amazon, you have a podcast, you have a website, you put your stuff online, people will find you. Right. Um, you to verify that they're legitimate and all of that. Oh yeah, obviously. And then that you get your money, but yeah, you have to, I mean, you have to understand contracts and, you know, maybe work with a lawyer and, you know, obviously due diligence, but that is a whole other discussion. Oh, so absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Well, and you write your fiction books under the pen uh, or the initials of J.F. Penn, correct? For Joanna Francis Penn, mm -hmm. P-E-N-N. And your books on Amazon are under Joanna Penn. And we will definitely link to all of that. And Joanna Penn at thecreativepen.com. Thank you so much for sharing all your vast wisdom and knowledge with us and your bubbly personality and enthusiasm and optimism for the publishing industry. Yes. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. It's been great to be here. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks so much for joining us for the I Create Daily podcast. Please let us know what creatives you would like us to interview and what topics you would be interested in hearing more about. And if you enjoyed this show, please leave a review on iTunes. We value your feedback. We read all the reviews and it just helps us get the word out on the I Create Daily podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks so much.